Greetings from the Sylvester Conference of Cancer Center at the University of Miami. My name is Dr. Alberto Caban Martinez. I'm an Associate Professor of Public Health Sciences. Hi, my name is Dr. Natasha schaefer Sali. I'm a Research Assistant Professor of Medicine here at the University of Miami and also serve as the Deputy Director of the Firefighter Cancer Initiative. So we're gathered today to give you a lecture on sleep deprivation in the fire service. It'll be an interactive lecture, so sit back, relax, and let's discuss a little bit about sleep deprivation. So to start off today, um, we're gonna tell you a little about the schedule and what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna have a few activities, um, and then we're gonna talk about what is sleep deprivation, go into sleep and fatigue, and then really talk to you about what has been done with firefighter and sleep research. We'll close out this lecture with doing an in-class activity to brainstorm some interventions that we can do about sleep in the fire service. So to start off with, I want you guys to take a moment um, with your classmates and sit there in a group and talk about why do, you we, why do you have to sleep? You know, write down some of the top ideas on a paper and list your ideas of why you think it's important for all human beings to have to sleep. So now that you've had a few minutes to meet with your peers and discuss about why we sleep, let's take a few minutes to investigate the biological clock. This is the uh, clock that runs our sleep-wake cycles as humans. I want you to begin by looking at the 6.45 a.m. mark off to the right-hand side. You'll notice that there's a sharp rise in blood pressure at 6.45 in the morning. Then around 7.30 in the morning, the secretion of melatonin ceases. This is telling us it's time to wake up um, and move away from our sleep cycle. Around 8.30, you'll begin to have um, intestinal movements. Uh, so that's usually why in the morning, right after we wake up, we have to go to the bathroom um, to do our constitutional uh, duties. Then at 8.30 in the morning, we begin to secrete uh, the largest bolus of testosterone levels. So our hormones begin to rise in order to prepare us for days physical and mental work. As you go throughout the day, now notice at 2.30 p.m. is when we have our best coordination. This is when you have the best proprioception and your hands can move and your feet can move in coordination. And that is at its peak around 2.30 in the afternoon. It's also around the same amount of time that we have the best reaction time and are alert to our environment and to our person. Around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, we notice that we have muscle strength and effectiveness at its highest peak. Uh, this is the time when uh, our muscles are most, tone, are most toned from all the physical activity we've been doing through the day. So around 6.30 p.m., we also incur maximum blood pressure, right? So all of the stresses that have been going on throughout our day sort of culminate around the 6.37 p.m. mark. Around 7 p.m., we have the temperature uh, is highest uh, for the internal clock in the human body. And then at 9 p.m., we start slowing down and begin the process of sleep. So at 9 p.m., melatonin uh, begins to initiate uh, rest and relaxation. And then our bowel movements begin to cease. And then around 10.30 p.m., we should hopefully be initiating our sleep cycle. This clock is the generic clock that initiates a sleep and wake. Through today's lecture, we'll be learning about what influences this clock and what are some of the things that we can do to protect and mitigate sleep deprivation. So our next activity that we're gonna go into is um, for those of us who operate on a daytime schedule, have you ever had trouble sleeping? So take a minute now again to work with your peers and talk about what prevents people from sleeping. Okay, so now that you guys have been able to meet with your peers and talk about what prevents people from sleeping, keep those notes handy so then you can reflect on them throughout the entire presentation. All right, so here's a question for you. Sleep is a time when your body and brain shut down for rest and relaxation. So as a group, come together with an idea, is it true or false? So now that you've got a few minutes to think about this, the answer is false. Actually, while we sleep, it's the most active and productive time period our entire cycle in a 24-hour period. The brain is most active in doing an all-control delete on our computer of the brain. It gives our, our brain a chance to reset, recalibrate hormones, and rest for the remainder of the evening. The other question is, the body has a natural ability to adjust to different sleep schedules, such as working a night shift or traveling through multiple time zones quickly. True or false?
So the answer is false. And the reason is because when we travel, we actually uh, do not adjust well to the changes in the clock. Uh, and the sun that uh, shines upon us. So when we have bright light exposed to us, it actually resets our biological clock, as we saw earlier, to a new time period. So when we actually travel, it also impacts our, our sleep-wake cycle. All right, so now that you've had a period of question and answer, let's go ahead and begin our lecture. We'll turn it over to Dr. Sally, who'll talk to us about sleep deficiency in the fire service. So what is shift work? Shift work is considered regularly scheduled work outside of your normal daytime working hours of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. So they can be broken up into either permanent night shifts, afternoon or evening shifts, or shifts beginning before 6 a.m. They're also condensed work weeks with extra long weekends, variable or rotating shifts, so day to evening or day to night, and they may also change weekly or monthly. So we know that some fire departments also do this where you may work um, certain days and then have other ones off and then you shift with your with your colleagues. So why do we need shift work? And the reason for this is critical services that are needed on a 24-hour basis, including police, fire, military, healthcare, utilities, and transportation. Also production process, so things where you need over eight hours of continuous work. The other thing is expensive machinery that must be used continuously to be profitable. So you work with different companies who have these large machines, they need someone to operate them and so they need to be working 24 hours a day. The other thing is support services for other shift workers. And lastly is convenience. So who does shift work? So when we look at the data, we see that men do more night and rotating shifts than women. Women, however, do more evening and part-time work. We also see that younger age individuals are more likely to do shift work and African-Americans are more likely than Caucasians to do shift work. We also see that single and single mothers are more likely to engage in either rotating or shift work. And then in a two job married couple, a fourth to a third have at least one shift worker in their relationship. So what is the most common reason for participating in shift work? And so in a survey done in the 90s, we saw that it's the nature of the job. 51% of individuals that were surveyed the reason for working as a shift worker was because of the nature of the job. We also saw that it was mandated by employer, uh, better pay, couldn't get another job, and better child care arrangements in the shift work that they were engaging in. But for the most part, it is the nature of the job. And for firefighters, that is the main reason why shift work is the only way that firefighters are engaging. So who engages in shift work? We see that 20 million Americans do shift work. 26% of them men and 18% of women. We do, however, see that there is a dropout rate at 20% after one year and 33% after two years. So this tolerance declines with age, usually due to the cumulative effects and also decreased physiological reserve after the age of 40. So let's talk about some of the shift works. So we have permanent nights. Most permanent night workers really get used to this schedule. Um, however, they do feel very tired and sleepy during the nighttime, and fatigue happens because of the return to day hours on their days off. So remember, when people are working nights and then they, their time off is during the day, there's still things going on during the day that keeps them up, including family and friends being active during the day, having to run errands and chores during the day. And so what happens is you end up sleeping less during the day. So even though you're off for those eight hours, uh, you, you aren't sleeping those full eight hours during the day. Then we have rotating shifts. So this is also very difficult because you can really never adapt to a set work schedule. So once your body is getting used to a certain way of sleeping, then it changes. So this used to be more fair to all workers. However, it is we are seeing some changes as far as their health because they're not able to adapt to a work schedule. So rotating shift workers have more complaints than others about physical and psychological health and have special risks compared to others like we talked about with a, uh, a set night shift. So what is sleep? Sleep we know is a dynamic regulated set of behavioral and physiological states during which many processes vital to health and well-being take place. So as we discussed earlier in the activity, it's not a time where our mind and body shut down. There's actually a lot of things happening during our sleep that is important for our overall health. So let's talk a little bit more about sleep. We spend about a third of our lives asleep. 
And so as we said, sleep is an active process. No organ or regulatory system shuts down. You do see a slight decrease in metabolic rate. However, nothing shuts down. We do still see some brain activity, and we know that some brain activity increases during sleep. So we have the delta waves. Many parts of the brain are as active as their awake periods, and we'll go over that in a bit um, when we look at the different rates. At least two hours of dream state per night, and we also see with specific hormones, they increase during sleep. So the growth hormone and the melatonin. So if you remember as a kid, they always say, oh, you make sure you sleep a lot because you're growing. So, you know, even though parents said that, there was a, a rhyme to the reason when saying that. And then there are specific cues that exist for the regulation of sleep that we'll go over. So sleep is important because sufficient sleep is really essential for maintaining your optimal physical health, mental and emotional functioning, and cognitive performance. Inadequate sleep time and poor quality of sleep interfere with the quality of life and can be hazardous to your health. And so this is really important why we want to educate, especially you firefighters, of how you can best take care of yourself when you're not on the job to therefore increase your performance and have a better quality of life. So current theory suggests that there's a two process model of sleep and wake regulation. So one is a sleep homeostasis or internal drive. So the exact mechanism is really unknown but your pressure to sleep increases throughout the day until an internal threshold is crossed, causing sleep to occur. So waking occurs when homeostatic drive decreases sufficiently to cross opposite threshold. The other thing that we'll learn about is the circadian rhythms. So this is, refers to the cyclical changes that occur over a 24 hour period driven by an internal biological clock located in the brain. So this is what we discussed in the very beginning when we talked about your circadian rhythm and how at different points in time during the day changes your phys physiological movements. The other thing is it's synchronized to the external physical environment. So this is why we're talking about even though you may sleep during the day if you're working at night, your body is still programmed to be asleep at, at nighttime rather than during the day and it's adjusting to the environment when it's dark rather than when it's light out. So sleep physiology. So here you can see there's three measures in which to measure uh, the physiology of your sleep. So you can see an electroencephalogram, an EEG. Those are where they have the cap on his head. And that is the brain waves from the scalp surface that they're able to measure. You can also do an electrooculogram, which is eye movements. And then also an electromyogram, which is muscle tone. So if you ever go see a, a sleep doctor, a sleep specialist, they would put all of these things on you to be able to track your sleeping. Again, as we, we talked about is your EEG waves, so your wakefulness. So we have our beta waves, which are irregular, low amps, high frequency waves. And this is indicative of alert and vigilant activity. So you can see here, there is your beta here, and that's when you're wakeful. And then you have your alpha waves, which is your regular medium frequency waves. And this is resting quietly, but awake. And then once you're sleeping, you have your theta, which is your deep meditation and dreaming. And then your delta waves, which is your deep sleep. So again, we can go back, we can go through the stages here. We have our alpha wave on top, which is our, act, our awake alpha and beta activity. And then you go from stage one of your theta of sleep down to your stage two and three. Once you get to your delta activity, then you're going into your deeper sleep, your meditation and dreaming, and then finally your REM sleep of theta and beta activity. So with REM sleep, it's increased cerebral activity. So erratic EAG, as you, we saw that the beta and theta waves are moving erratically. We also see the rapid eye movements and loss of core muscle tone. So if you ever see a sleeping baby and you see their arms kind of flop, that's when you you know that they're in a REM sleep. Also, auto, your autonomic arousal, so you have an elevated heart rate, blood pressure, and respirations, and then that's when you have your narrative dreams with much visual imagery. You can see exactly the different autonomic activities that happen and at during when in your sleep. So you can see your heart rate during your slow wave sleep, it's in a slow decline. With your REM sleep, that it's variable with high burst. You also can see that if we're looking at skeletal muscle system, you know, for example, our, our knee jerk reflex is normal during our slow wave sleep here, and then suppress when we're in our REM sleep. Our growth 
our hormone secretion of growth hormone is high during our slow wave sleep, and then it becomes low during our REM sleep. Again, this is just another chart to show you our sleep cycle. So when you start your sleep onset of REM, you have your first episode here, and then you go down and then back up throughout. And then after about four or five hours of sleep, you can see then it becomes pretty stable, and that's really important. So especially when we're talking about the fire service, if you're not getting that full, you know, getting to sleep for at least four or five hours, you never reach this final episode of REM, which is your total recharge. So let's talk about sleep across the lifespan. So we'll talk about from early age to child, adolescent, and then until older adult. So all aspects of your sleep behavior across the lifespan demonstrate a large degree of variability among individuals and across cultures. Sleep patterns are shaped by the intrinsic biological processes and psychosocial factors, such as cultural norms, family values, school, and work. So with our newborns and our infants, we know that they have two stages. So 50% of quiet or non-eye rapid movement sleep, and then 50% of our REM sleeping. So with a newborn and infant, they sleep for about 16 to 17 hours within a 24 hour period with frequent awakenings for feeding and nurturing. Moving on to children ages one through five, the amount of sleep time decreases to about 11 to 13 hours over a 24 hour period, and then generally sleep throughout the night. And then they nap during the day as needed. Once we get into our middle childhood and adolescence, uh, our sleep time is now about 10 to 12 hours, and they may experience some sleep problems such as bedwetting or nightmares or uh, sleepwalking. And now with our adolescents, they need about around nine hours of nightly sleep with, you know, for optimal health, emotional well-being, and cognitive functioning. They often experience delayed sleep phase syndrome, so they can't go to sleep until late at night and prefer to sleep later in the morning. And so most adolescents at this age, 12 to 18, frequently do not get enough sufficient, get enough sleep. And then sleep in adulthood, you generally need about seven and a half to eight hours of nightly sleep and increasing frequency of problem sleeping, including common sleep disorders such as obstructive apnea, insomnia, and restless leg syndrome. And then once you become an aging adult, so 65 and older, you still need about seven to eight hours of total sleep time, but it may decrease to as little as six hours at night with naps common during the day. We also see an increased number of nighttime awakenings, usually um, awaken very early in the morning, and sleep may impact it by illness or medications. And so, you know, you may see with parents or grandparents that they do nap during the day or they may be just sitting in the chair talking to you and fall asleep. It's very common. And so how do we assess sleep? So we always include questions about sleep when assessing the overall health status, except in emergency situations, of course, and then inquire about the number of hours firefighters generally sleep and how well they sleep. So we want to look at both the quantity and the quality. Whenever possible, we observe in a hospital or a care facility and then record firefighter sleep patterns. We also use standardized sleep assessment tools if possible. So using a survey to inquire about a client's normal sleep pattern encourages a thorough assessment, including the sleep environment, the quality of sleep, the amount of sleep, and the problems that they have associated with sleep. So here you can see the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. So this is a survey that's used, it's 19 items with about seven different domains and the scaling of a zero to three score. So asking uh, participants about their quality of sleep and that's a way that we assess it. So here you can see that if standardized assessment is not available, we use what we call BEARS, is a sleep assessment as a guide. So B for bedtime problems, E excessive sleepiness during the day, A awakening at night, R for regularity of the sleep, so number of hours, and then S for sleep disorders, including sleep apnea and snoring. Also, we inquire about the lifestyle factors impacting their sleep, such as their work schedule, their alcohol use, any illnesses, medications, bed sharing arrangements, you know, if you have a newborn, um, all of these types of things, even if you have a new dog, these are things that may be disrupting your, your sleep. So what are the health effects of sleep deficiency? Both are immediate and long-term. So some of the health hazards that we know are GI problems, so our gastrointestinal problem, cardiovascular, sleep and stress-related disorders, drug and alcohol use, 
risk from prolonged exposure to chemical and biological substances at, and other hazards, and then also effects on pregnancy. So what happens with our digestive system? We do see an increased risk incidence of ulcers. So what happens? We often eat at night when digestion and other body functions are slowed down. We may eat less nutritious food at night, so more snacking, uh, chips, ice cream, anything that's available that's easy, and then also drinking more caffeine products at night. So with our firefighters, we know that you guys are up late, you're up throughout the night, and you know you may be drinking a few cups of coffee, Red Bull, energy drinks to make sure you're staying up throughout the night so you're not missing a call. The other thing that we see is that 75% of our night workers versus 20% of our day workers have complaints of GI upsets. So the complaints usually include loss of appetite, constipation, heartburn, abdominal pain, many problems that may not show up until later years. And again, the reason for this is usually the poor food quality, more caffeine, more alcohol, more tobacco, all these things that are used to keep yourself awake. And now let's talk about the cardiac and cardiovascular problems that you may see. We do see an increased incidence of ischemic disease, elevated triglyceride levels in phase advanced workers. Maybe it may be related to the disturbance of the circadian rhythm, blood pressure and pulse rhythms. And then also substance abuse is more likely in shift workers. And hypertension. So shift workers were found to be have approximately 25% greater chance of developing significant hypertension than non-shift workers. Again, because you are up throughout the, the night, you're not, you're not getting that, that solid sleep that's having energy drinks, caffeine, not eating well. This is all leading to a higher risk of getting hypertension. Cognitive ability. So recent studies have also found a deterioration in cognitive ability in shift workers versus non-shift workers. So we see this increase with the duration of exposure. So the effect seems to diminish four years after discontinuation. So after someone retires, maybe from the fire service, they may see it's about four years till they feel like they've um, gone back to, to themselves. Psychologically, we do see that with shift workers, psychologically, they demonstrate more depression and despondency. They're also more likely to use psychotropic drugs or require hospitalization and they will have magnification of underlying depression or bipolar disorders. So the circadian rhythm disturbance may also cause the increased uh, incidence of depression in this, in this worker group. So what are also some social risks? Our number one problem is missing family and friends because of the work. You're working all day and you may miss out on different events. You would also rather lose sleep than miss social opportunities. So as we talked about, even though you're off and it should be a time that you're sleeping, you still don't want to miss those opportunities with your family and significant others and friends. And so instead of sleeping, you may take a couple hour nap and then go enjoy your family time. Also some activities that are flexible. So gardening, woodworking, fixing cars, these are things that you're able to do in your spare time, which is helpful. But some are not flexible, you know, including clubs, team sports, childcare, school activities. You know, we've worked with you firefighters for a long time, so we know that, you know, your shift ended and you had a, a hard night, but that doesn't really stop that, you know, school starts the next day and you need to pick up your kids, drop them off at school, pick them up when school ends, as well as take to different team sports. So these are things that also play a role in not getting enough sufficient sleep when you're off. The other social impact we see is we see an increase in divorce, family violence, social isolation, sexual dysfunction, and many affect women more than men. So the other circadian rhythm related issues is peak bronchoreactivity between the times of 4 and 7 a.m. So asthma may be worse in workers who are exposed to irritants. So if you're awake during these hours and you're actually active and being out in the environment, it may also increase your risk for having bronchial issues, especially if you already have a history of asthma. Shift work also increases your glucose levels and insulin for insulin-dependent diabetics. So one study showed that a 35% increased risk for developing diabetes in those who are shift workers. Sleep deprivation also lowers your seizure threshold and increases the frequency of migraines. So the absorption, excretion, metabolism, and peak effect of medications is affected by circadian rhythm. So this may also play a role if you're on certain medications. So another risk is cancer. 
So we see in colorectal cancer specifically that suggests that workers rotating night shift at least three nights per month for 15 or more years may increase their risk for colorectal cancer in women by 35%. So we see this in, you know, shift workers, not just firefighters, but police, nurses, anyone who's doing uh, shift work and working night shifts. Also, shorter durations have also increased their risk. So this may be due to the suppression of melatonin production with nocturnal light exposure. Melatonin, we know, has anti-cancer properties. And breast cancer. So we know that breast cancer is attributed to the inhibition of melatonin production by light exposure during the night as well. So we have seen that many female... Uh, Firefighters, but shift workers overall have an increased incidence of breast cancer. And then we talk about our shift work sleep disorder. So we have circadian rhythm disruption, which we know happens because you're up during the night when you know your body is telling you to be sleeping. Insomnia, disrupted sleep schedules, overall reduced performance, difficulties with personal relationships, irritability and depressed mood. And then sleep apnea is about 11.6% for shift workers compared to the 5% in the general population. And the other thing we see, which is really important, especially for our firefighters, is the increased accidents. So we see going to and from work, you got off a long shift, you're sitting at a red light, and without even realizing it, you've, you've fallen asleep for those few seconds, increasing your risk of getting in an accident. We also see lower performance, higher error rates, and a 20% increase in ergonomic workers' compensation cases. So again, getting injured due to not having you know, your peak performance because you are lacking sleep. So other common sleep problems are parasomonians, which is including sleepwalking, bedwetting, nightmares, and night terrors. So all common in children, we also see nocturnal sleep-related eating disorders and teeth grinding. Very common in people who are in high-stress jobs, um, as well as doing shift work because you, you're not getting enough sleep. The other sleep disorders that we see include insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg sy syndrome, and narcolepsy. So what is insomnia? I know we hear it a lot, but it's defined as trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. So this may be due to stress, anxiety, hormonal changes, lifestyle, environmental factors. Again, it may be because you're working at a fire station every three days and now it's hard for you to fall asleep once you're home because you are constantly on edge thinking that the bell is going to ring. It also may be transient. It may be something that just lasts for a few weeks because maybe you're going through a stressful situation. Short term, which is one to six months, which we often see you know, if you're pregnant or if you're having some other kind of physical um, ailment going on that's making you uncomfortable sleeping. Or maybe chronic, that it may be over six months, which we often see a lot with our firefighters that, you know, because of their job, um, they have a constant state of insomnia, even at home when they're not at the fire station. Obstructive sleep apnea. So during sleep, breathing pauses or stops for 10 to 20 seconds or more. And this happens 20 to 30 times an hour. So your oxygen levels in blood drop. Normal breathing starts again with a loud snort. So this is people who are constantly with the loud snoring, we know that they have the sleep apnea. What happens is this results in excessive daytime sleepiness because whether you realize it or not, 10 to 20 seconds or more, 20 to 30 times an hour, your, your breathing pauses. So again, you're not getting that full rest. We often see this associated with overweight or obese individuals, and it can be treated with continuous positive airway pressure or a CPAP. All right, so now I'm going to show you a video of obstructive sleep apnea. So this video will be able to show you exactly what happens to our body if you have obstructive sleep apnea and what causes uh, someone to be snoring. When you breathe, air travels down your throat, through your windpipe, and into your lungs. The narrowest part of that pathway is in the back of your throat. When you're awake, muscles keep that pathway relatively wide open. But when you sleep, those muscles relax, allowing the opening to narrow. The air passing through this narrowed opening may cause the throat to vibrate. That causes snoring, which many people experience. But in some people, the throat closes so much that enough air can't get through to the lungs. When this happens, the brain sends an alarm to open the airway. Most often, this is associated with a brief arousal from sleep. The brain quickly reactivates the muscles that hold the throat open. Air gets through again, and the brain goes back to sleep. 
This disorder is called obstructive sleep apnea. So restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is a neurological disorder characterized by unpleasant sensations in the legs and an uncontrollable urge to move when resting as an attempt to relieve these feelings. So we know it causes difficulty falling asleep. Uh, the cause is really unknown and it's very difficult to treat. Narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder caused by the brain's inability to regulate sleep wake cycles normally. And again, the cause is unknown. So we see that there's frequent urges to sleep occurring anytime. It could be disabling due to involuntary falling asleep at school, work, or anywhere. And it really cannot be cured, but it can be treated with various medications. So the treatment of sleep problems. We know that there's behavioral modification programs, hypnosis, meditation that may be effective. Also self-prescribed over-the-counter sleep aids and then prescription medications. So some of the sleep medications we know of, of over-the-counter include antihistamines or drugs containing diphenhydramine hydrochloride, such as Benadryl. We also see Advil PM or Unisum. So we know some people say would take, you know, an Advil PM or maybe NyQuil to help them go to sleep after a long day. Some of the other over-the-counter sleeping aids, they're not intended for long-term use. So it may interfere with your alertness during the day. So you should avoid driving or other potentially dangerous activities, especially as a firefighter if you're taking that and then going to work the next day. The other thing is it reduces your quality of sleep by decreasing the amount of time spent in deep sleep. So just because you're falling asleep using those, you think you're helping, but it's actually reducing the, the type of sleep and the quality of sleep that you are receiving when you are sleeping. Some prescription medications you know, must be used under the direction of a physician, but again, it often does not cure the cause of sleeping problems, but it just alleviates the symptoms for the time being. The other real issue is that it can be addictive and you may become dependent on these drugs in order for you to sleep on, on your own. And this also may cause some physical side effects and may interact with other medications or alcohol that you may be taking. Some of the primary classes include our short acting sedatives. So hypnotics as such as eight, Ambien, Sonata, Lunesta, things that you hear about all the time. You also have your melatonin receptor agonists, your benzodiazepines, and then your sedating antidepressants. To get a good night's sleep, we really wanna practice good sleep hygiene. So maintaining a regular sleep-wake schedule whenever possible, even on the weekends and vacation. Avoid napping during the day, especially after 3 p.m. So really you wanna limit your naps to less than an hour. So I know we talk in the fire service of um, when you're not super busy during the day, that it is okay to take an, an, a nap. Um, you know, not napping while you're on shift for three hours, but if you're taking a 30, 30 to 45 minute power nap, it's actually really good for you. And then also establishing a regular relaxed bedtime routine. So you don't wanna be on your computer in your bed doing a million things. You wanna make sure that where you sleep is a time for relaxation. And so that's the only thing that you should be doing there. So guidelines for better sleep also include exercising regularly, but not within two hours of your sleep. Avoid eating large meals just before going to sleep. Also avoid caffeinated beverages, particularly after lunch. And then the last is to avoid the use of alcohol or nicotine as these substances can disrupt your sleep as well. So then we talk about environmental fa factors that may impact your sleep. So light, so exposure to light inhibits your ability to fall asleep and bright light in the morning can shorten your sleep. So if you have the ability to get blackout shades, especially if you are sleeping during the day and catching on sleep, you wanna make sure that your room is as dark as possible. Also noise, you wanna limit the noise. So, you know, being by traffic, having the TV on, music, your phones and, com and computers nearby, it can wake you up. Bed sharing, so if you have little ones and they're sharing a bed with you, or if your significant other may be snoring and they move a lot, they may also be impacting your ability to get good sleep. Room temperature, it, you know, it should not be too hot or too cold because that can also inhibit your sleep. So knowing what is the right temperature for you in order to get the best sleep on your off days. So good sleep we know promotes good health. So assessing your sleep patterns and your sleeping environment, and then implementing occupational and work-related interventions to promote adequate sleep. So if you, at the fire station, if you're able to implement blackout um, curtains in the, in the bunks, if you're able to have a, uh, a nap time uh, per se while you're on shift for just 30 to 45 minutes to get that power nap if you know you're gonna have a long night. And so at this point, we're gonna break 
and Dr. Cabal Martinez will follow up um, finishing this lecture. Thank you. And welcome back. So we'll continue our lecture now talking about fatigue and sleep. There are actually separate topics, both fatigue and sleep, but they're very much interrelated. And we'll spend the next couple of minutes trying to understand a little bit about how fatigue impacts sleep and overall firefighter health and safety. So you may remember that working in different uh, settings, such as either wildland, wildland urban interface, as a fire investigator, or even as a professional career firefighter, all require a lot of physical and mental demands. These demands over time can have a taxing toll on our ability to physically um, and, and cognitively, mentally think through these tasks throughout the day. So fatigue is actually something that accumulates. Some individuals are under the impression that oh, when you sleep over the weekend, you can restore yourself and, and sleep the entire weekend and feel 100% recharged. Compare that to fatigue, where fatigue actually accumulates over the time period that we work. So let's talk a little bit about the awareness of fatigue first. So there are a lot of critical management decisions, sort of stress situations that will create a sleep debt in an individual. And this will, over time, increase the chances of fatigue impairing your ability to do your physical or your mental tasks. So remember earlier, we talked about the biological clock and the circadian rhythm that is maintained through that clock. So by working rather than sleeping between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., we actually impact our ability uh, to be restful and increases our chance of fatigue. So it is the circadian rhythm in the brain that coordinates uh, our sleep-wake periods, our individual body temperatures, our hormone levels when they start and when they stop, our ability to digest, our cardiovascular responses, and most importantly, our performance, both our physical and mental performance. So changes in the work shift, either moving into a night shift or say jet lag from traveling can definitely impact uh, sleep and cause sleep disturbances. It can increase sleep wakefulness while we're awake. It can also degrade mental and physical conditions uh, throughout the work day. You can even have a really bad mood. If you've been really tired uh, for the extended period of time, this has been shown to create increased emotional stress and not to mention gastrointestinal issues. So if you're sleep deprived or you're feeling very fatigued, it's very possible that you will experience changes in your uh, GI tract. Let's talk a little bit about some of these fatigue factors. What are things that influence our, our feeling of fatigue? So extended shifts or work days can result in really prolonged wakefulness, sort of a period of a very long time that we're awake. And fatigue from long or multiple shifts can also impact our, our timing of fatigue. So if you restrict time for sleep, say getting up really early in the morning and going to bed really late, you will be living in a sleep debt and eventually have cumulative sleep debt uh, leading to fatigue. So low activity, repetitive tasks, and monitoring roles have the potential to increase risk. These are all risk factors that are known for fatigue. Passiveness creates boredom and complacency, so tasks that require somebody to be stationary for an extended period of tasks. And boredom can also unmask sleeplessness from people that feel very tired uh, from just standing uh, stationary for an extended period of time. Think about this when you're doing a fire incident response. How could this fatigue potentially impact your ability to respond on scene, both physically and mentally, to the incident at hand? High intensity workloads such as critical decision making um, or overhead or work stress can definitely impact your, your feeling of fatigue. Increased fatigue because of high physical or cognitive workload is also a risk factor or continuous workloads without taking a few minute breaks. Earlier, Dr. Sally mentioned the impact of napping as a strategic way of, of, of refreshing oneself and limiting fatigue uh, onset. We also have to think about the physical environment. So not just your activities that you do, both physical and mental, but the, the area around you. The physical environment has the opportunity to increase fatigue through temperature, right? If it's too hot or if it's too cold, through the humidity, through the altitude in which you're working at, the air quality, if oxygen tension is low or high, as well as noise and vibration have all been correlated to feelings of fatigue. Fatigue definitely has an impact on decision making. Right? So individuals that are in a, in, a, in a role, in a critical safety role to make decisions about an incident command can be more prone to fatigue than actual person who's physically moving. Why is that? Well, the physical movement actually keeps your body moving 
And if you're stationary, you have to think through the task at hand, which you can then feel more fatigued through. What are some of the effects of fatigue on the body? So these are some of the known factors when you're feeling fatigued. You can have de uh, degraded cognitive function. So this affects our ability uh, to think, to make judgment calls, to do decision making. There can also be decreased alertness. You might have less situational awareness about what's going on to your person or to your team around you. You're also more prone to errors. You could maybe miss a radio call, do something sloppy, or misunderstand orders that are being dictated to you. You might also have impaired concentration and not be able to uh, pay attention closely to what's being asked of you. You can also be irritable or have mood. You could feel complacency or irritability from being fatigued, slow reaction times to what you're being asked to do, and even degraded skills and being able to physically meet um, the demands you're being asked to do. Growing research is now also showing us that fatigue can impact your immune system. So factors that reduce the immune function and open the door for issues like respiratory illness are prolonged exertion and exhaustion, stress, inadequate uh, energy and nutrition, Smoking, including cigarettes, can also impact uh, immune function, as does sleep deprivation, disruption of the circadian rhythms, and dehydration. Let's stop for a second to talk about stress and fatigue. So stress has been linked to increases in cortisol and epinephrine. This is adrenaline, the fight or flight hormone. This prepares our body in order to react at the time of a fire incident response. Do these stress hormones erase fatigue? You know, do they uh, move away the feeling of being tired after 24 hours of being awake? And the answer is no. Adrenaline actually provides a temporary uh, reprieve um, or rest from the feeling of fatigue. But immediately after the hormone is gone, you start feeling a rapid decline in your physical and your emotional ability to do the task at hand. So this is so critical during an emergency uh, response situation in which fatigue uh, may actually impact your spatial orientation, your loss of vigilance around what's going in your immediate area, as well as the ability to monitor your workload, therefore leading to miscalculating tasks and requirements. In addition, during emergency response, failure to consider some of these consequences or actions may actually uh, impact the outcome of the uh, incident response. Um, so by not developing a backup plan or performing double checks, you yourself, along with your peers, may actually uh, have a, a detrimental effect on your effort and activities. Let's continue our line of thought here on fatigue awareness. So accumulated, or also known as chronic fatigue, um, impacts our alertness, it decreases our productivity, and compromises immune function. There are some misconceptions that I want to talk to you about that uh, oftentimes in the community folks get wrong. The first is that many believe that a well-trained, a well-motivated professional, or even having previous experience with sleep deprivation really prepares you for the fight of physiological consequences of sleep loss. And that's wrong. That's actually not the way it works. People, especially sleepy people, despite how much training you may have, can reliably um, underestimate their level of alertness and performance, ultimately maybe impacting injury or risk during a fire incident response. Another misconception that we often hear is that there is one work rest program that prevents fatigue for everyone. And that's not true. Every human is different. And what rest works for one individual may be slightly different for the other. As you grow in your career within the fire service, we encourage you to explore what are restful techniques uh, and interventions that you can do to feel that you are not engaging in sleep loss or sleep debt, as well as managing your own fatigue uh, experience. So sleep cycles and circadian rhythms can be very complicated and understanding your own individual um, sleep rest cycle is really critical to maintaining a health and safety uh, career as a firefighter. So what are these signs and symptoms of someone who's feeling fatigued? Okay, so poor decision making is usually one of the early signs. You'll start seeing an individual that may um, have some forgetfulness or may not um, continue a train of thought as they're presenting a topic or speaking to you on something. You could have slowed reaction time, maybe difficult communicating, some forgetfulness. Some individuals may even just fixate on something and look at an object or look at, at a distance away as they're feeling tired and trying to recuperate their energy. You can have lethargy, you can have bad mood or emotional position, or you're also maybe about to nod off. How about those firefighters that are sitting there at the station, tip, uh, shaking their head down, falling asleep and nodding off? So these are all signs and symptoms to look out for for fatigue. So what are some strategies we can do to mitigate this? So alertness strategies. These are some prevention strategies that use before or between shifts to reduce the effects 
of fatigue, sleep loss, and circadian rhythms, right? So part, some of this could potentially be napping, strategic napping to help us recuperate. There could also be operational strategies, and these are strategies that not necessarily impact the individual physiology of the firefighter, but also help the organization of the work that's being done to help support and mitigate fatigue uh, issues within the fire service. So alertness strategies, let's go through some specific examples. Before the work shift, it's often uh, best to get the, the best amount of sleep possible. So what does that mean? I understand being a firefighter, it can be difficult um, in a 24 hour shift to get rest. But when you do have an opportunity to sleep or nap, please take those opportunities to do so. Use napping as appropriate, that is allowed. Even to have discussions with your station about policies that could be done to support and encourage um, fatigue mitigation, such as strategic napping. Try to use up to two hours of naps during extended assignments when it's possible. Up to 20 to 90 minutes of nap may work best. And this is really important because, you know, some people 20 minutes is restful for a nap break and others a little bit longer. If you nap too much, you might actually start your sleep cycle and feel really groggy after you wake up from the nap. So that might mean you went too far deep into sleep uh, for a nap. Practice doing different uh, napping techniques so that you can see where your cutoff is, whether it's 20 minutes or 30 minutes that you don't wake up feeling groggy. Let's talk a little bit about what are some operational techniques that we could do around the fire station um, to improve napping. So first is engage in active conversations with others, right? So if you're staying up late, um, doing a response call, talk to each other. Speaking to two different people actually keeps the brain active and alert, as well as moving. Consider maybe an active uh, meeting, walking around the fire station in order to stay awake. Do something physical, stretching, moving around and also engage in light, moderate activities such as walking, as I mentioned. Some additional strategies is caffeine consumption. So responsible, moderate caffeine consumption, right? It requires some knowledge and experience, but you can use it to temporarily stimulate yourself and stay awake through the long hauls. We actually discourage the use of a lot of energy drinks. You wanna be able to be sure to moderate the level of caffeine intake you have during your 24 hour working shift. Try to be sensible about the nutrition that you do. Eat moderate portions and try not to skip meals throughout your shift in order to keep your metabolism going over the 24 hour period. So often we get the question if adrenaline from is, is adrenaline a release from excitement or danger from overcoming fatigue? So adrenaline is actually produced uh, from our body for a flight uh, or fight response. And it's a temporary reprieve. It doesn't stay there for an extended period of time and you will feel tired after um, the adrenaline hormone is released from our body. So let's talk a little about safety vigilance. When you work as a team with firefighters, it's really great to be able to be aware of each other um, to protect each other during fire incident response. Um, so avoid sleeping near hazardous areas, right? And make sure that if you are um, in a wildland situation and you're sleeping outside, that you stay clear of the um, elements that are out and around you. Pull over um, and park vehicles in a safe location. Uh, if you're in the rig or the truck, try to make sure that you are clear of any hazardous uh, conditions around your environment while you're taking your sleep. And don't push operations to critical decisions if you're very fatigued, just stop and rest at that moment in time. So what are some countermeasures that we can do in order to stop the fatigue? So you can improve your fitness and maintain regular physical activity. Individuals that maintain regular and consistent fitness um, have really strong mitigation strategies for fatigue and for sleep. Try to get the right amount of sleep before you start your shift. So if you're about to start a 24 hour shift that's demanding at a fire station, try to make sure that you don't stay up the night before to begin your 7 a.m. shift. Practice working cycles, meaning try to do hard things early uh, in your shift and easier things towards the end so that the most uh, demanding tasks don't get slated and fatigue is onsetting towards the end of the shift. And also try to see if you can adjust your working conditions. Are there elements of your environment at the fire station or within the cabin of the truck that you can adjust in order to make it a little better and not make you feel sleepy or tired? Take rest breaks or nap every 20 to 90 minutes. Try to change tasks and tools to keep yourself physically active. Take solid liquid carbohydrate supplements to help maintain blood glucose, energy, and alertness. Again, moderation is key with nutrition and diet over a 24-hour shift. So summarizing, fatigue can actually affect everyone from our rookie firefighters to even our more senior chief officers who are making uh, mental demands on decision-making during critical incident responses. Fatigue affects individuals differently. 
So depending on the individual's physical fitness, their diet and nutrition, they may experience the sense of fatigue a little different than you. So learn a little bit about your body and your fatigue rates. How does strategic napping uh, help you uh, relieve uh, the feeling of fatigue? Practice vigilance, right? So when you're in an environment that's high risk, make sure that you're aware of your surroundings and, and those of your peers in order so that you can uh, mitigate any feelings of fatigue. And then people that are incapable of making self-determinations of fatigue, we gotta keep them safe, so make sure you monitor them. And your leadership uh, in your fire department should be helping you um, with fatigue management, both at the individual worker level as well as at, at the workforce level. Let's spend a minute or two looking at what's the latest research that we know on fatigue and research in the fire service. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of literature out there done on firefighters. And through the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, we're beginning to study more and more about the impacts of sleep on cancer in the fire service. So what we do know is that fatigue occurs rapidly in simulated make-work studies, meaning that in tasks that require high physical demands, we see fatigue onset start very quickly. Performance is better maintained in studies of actual or meaningful work. So for example, when, even when there's sleep and food deprivation, fit and motivated soldiers are able to maintain a sustained performance. So this goes back to the key that uh, physically fit firefighters have better opportunities to maintain um, uh, fatigue regulation. Some of the current research also highlights um, some of the elements that are affecting fatigue. This also comes to us from the University of Montana where they've studied fireline uh, studies, frontline firefighters, and have evaluated fatigue, sleep, its relationship to energy intake and expenditure, immune function, and mood as we've discussed previously. So how does fitness impact fatigue? The answer is yes, it certainly does. Fit workers accomplish more and uh, address better the fatigue feeling um, throughout a work experience. All right, let's talk about energy. So do nutrition and hydration influence fatigue? And as we've been discussing, yes, the relationship between um, nutrition and individual hydration has a, a direct impact on individuals' mental and physical fatigue. Fatigue is reduced and, and more work is done when energy needs are actually met in the individual. A question that we often get and has been studied is looking at energy supplementation during a 24-hour shift. So blood glucose is maintained when there's carbohydrate supplement. So if you anticipate a physical demand coming up during your 24-hour shift, it's okay and good practice to do some carbohydrate supplementation before that shift. And again, moderation is key. We've also learned from research studies from Rub uh, Ruby and Gaskill that energy expenditure is also higher with supplementation. So when you engage in that task, energy levels will be expended at a much higher rate. Let's talk for a second about shift length. So the time of, uh, that we are working. Can the shift length influence fatigue? And the answer is a, a resounding yes. Fatigue accumulates and immune function declines over extended periods of time, which is why in the fire service we have a 48 hour period of rest in order to recuperate from the 24 hour physical and mental demands of that shift. And so fatigue is actually uh, intrinsically in kind to the number of hours that we spend working cumulati cumulatively over a shift period. So then what's the right ratio of work to rest? So yes, uh, rest does influence uh, sleep uh, fatigue. Um, so the right ratio of rest to sleep can help avoid some chronic fatigue. In the fire service, we usually set 24 hour on, 40, uh, 48 hours off to recuperate um, from the demands of that individual 24 hour shift. So in conclusion, as fatigue progresses, vigilance, one's awareness of surroundings can decline. So we don't necessarily hear, see, think, or focus well as reaction times can be slow from increasing fatigue levels. Individuals and crews can differ in their ability to perform extended operations. It will depend on the type of firefighter that you are. If you're a wildland, fire investigator, fire trainer, career firefighter, or maybe do two of each. And those individual experiences might impact the level of fatigue you have during that 24 hour shift. And crews will respond differently um, to their exposures and fatigue levels. So make, make sure to keep everyone safe that's on the scene. Lastly, the two to one work ratio works best. As we've been discussing, thinking about how you pair a 24 hour work shift with a 48 hour work shift is important for rest and recuperation from a fatigue experience. Nutrition and hydration supplements can help moderate some of the effects that one feels over the 24 hour shift. 
uh, supporting um, energy, cognitive function, the physical and mental output, as well as the immune function over the firefighter, not just during the 24 hour shift, but community over your life course as a, as a firefighter. Individuals and crews will definitely differ from your abilities. So make sure that you recognize the signs of fatigue for yourself and for your crewmates. Also implement fatigue countermeasures at the individual level and at the organizational level, and make sure you mandate rest when it's necessary. If a team or a group is, is tired, is it possible to actually sign them out and give the responsibilities to a nearby fire station um, so that they can have adequate uh, recuperation? So let's spend a minute talking to our colleague, uh, Dr. Laura Barger uh, from the Harvard School of Medicine. Uh, to learn a little bit about her own research in the area of uh, sleep and weight. In our study of nearly 7,000 firefighters across the country, we found that about 80% were overweight or obese. That's not too much higher than the general public, but Firefighters might have a more difficult time with obesity or might be more at risk because they probably get less sleep than the general public due to the nature of their work, the shift work, the 24 to 48 hour shifts. We know that people that get less than six hours of sleep a night are more prone to obesity. So somewhere along the line uh, in evolution, metabolism and a sleep became linked. We're the only creatures who selectively sleep deprive ourselves. Normally if an animal is sleep deprived it's because there, there's something wrong and so somewhere along the lines in evolution when people when animals aren't sleeping the body says something's wrong hold on to uh, whatever you have and so uh, we know that the hormones that regulate appetite are affected when people aren't getting enough sleep. So leptin, the hormone that says I'm satisfied, goes down, and ghrelin, the hormone that indicates I'm hungry, increases when you're not getting adequate sleep. We know that people that don't get uh, enough sleep uh, selectively choose carbohydrates more than healthy snacks. And so for many, many of those reasons might be affecting firefighters' um, obesity levels um, because of the nature of their schedules and um, the sleep that they're able to get. Sleep is a shared responsibility between employers and employees. The firefighters need to maximize their sleep opportunities before they come into work and during their shifts. Fire departments need to look at their policies governing sleep to ensure that firefighters have the opportunity to nap when they aren't working uh, and at the, or at the firehouse and to provide adequate facilities. In some fire departments, we've gone in and put blackout shades on all of the windows in the sleep compartment so that um, when there is an opportunity, firefighters are able to get better sleep. Um, we've worked with some fire departments on alarms so that when there's a call, everyone in the firehouse doesn't have to be woken up if they're not needed for that particular call. Um, so there are different solutions, but they're unique to each fire department. And so I think everyone has to uh, take a look at their department and their policies and see what they can implement to improve sleep in their firefighters. So now we just had heard from Dr. Laura Barger at Harvard Medical School, who described to us some of her ongoing and really uh, fundamental research on understanding sleep in the fire service, as well as sleep obstructive apnea. We're really fortunate to have her work uh, as a fingerprint in the literature because there's actually not too much research on sleep and fatigue in the fire service. Let's spend a few minutes talking about it uh, and going in depth into her science. So we get a little bit about what should we do. So common sleep disorders can increase the risk of motor vehicle crashes and adverse health outcomes in firefighters. So really common sleep disorders that we see in the general population, such as sleep um, uh, obstructive apnea um, in the general population can also impact our firefighters. 
in her study, uh, Dr. Barger is examining whether high risk of sleep disorder is linked to motor vehicle crashes, to cardiovascular disease, and other mental and physical outcomes that happen in firefighters. So she recruited a national sample of firefighters, almost 6,933 uh, firefighters from 66 fire departments, where she collected information on common sleep disorders using uh, validated screening tools. She also surveyed the firefighters about their health and safety practices, and documentation was collected for the individual motor vehicle crashes that happen within each department. So what did she learn? So uh, impressively enough, almost 37.2% of the firefighters she screened tested positive for some type of sleep disorder. So that included about 28% of firefighters that had obstructive sleep apnea, 6% that reported insomnia, 9% that had some sort of shift work disorder, and about 3.4% who reported restless leg syndrome. Among those that tested a positive for a sleep disorder, they were at significant risk for getting into a motor vehicle crash, self-reporting falling asleep while driving. There's also an, a two and a half time increased risk of cardiovascular disease because of the uh, sleep disorder. She also documented that the firefighters that who screened positive for sleep disorders experienced uh, diabetes, almost three times depression, almost four times anxiety, and reported overall poor health status. If we asked them how would they rate their health from one to five, with five being excellent health, um, oftentimes those that reported a sleep disorder had poor health uh, sleep status. A second critical study done by Dr. Barger is looking at the randomization of a prospective study on the impact of a sleep health program. So now she's evaluating an intervention. What could be done to actually improve sleep within the fire service? And the goal here was to test the hypothesis that if you implement within a fire department a sleep health program, you can improve sleep health education and sleep disorders through screening. How did she do this? Well, she, she did it what's called a prospective station level randomized field-based intervention. That's a lot of garbled goop to basically say that um, she took a bunch of fire stations and randomized some of them to receive the intervention and others that did not. What was the intervention? So sleep health education was a, a centerpiece of this type of, 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 of intervention. She included questionnaires assessing sleep disorders and sleep clinic referrals for any of the firefighters who screened positive for a sleep disorder. More specifically, the intervention was a mandatory educational session, voluntary sleep disorder screening, and a sleep disorder diagnosis and treatment for any firefighter who tested positive for a sleep disorder. So what did she find? So firefighters that got randomly picked to be in the intervention for the sleep education um, had the opportunity to complete the disordered screening, reported 46% fewer disability days than those assigned to a control station. So meaning firefighters that didn't get the sleep health education actually had higher uh, disability days than those that did not. In addition, uh, she also noticed that there was really no major differences in injury or motor vehicle crashes between the two groups. So overall, the big takeaway message is that a firefighter who implements uh, a workplace uh, sleep health education program and a screening program in the fire service can improve uh, injuries and reduce work loss disability in firefighter uh, workforce. So let's wrap up our lecture on sleep and sleep deprivation with how we can make an impact in mitigating this in the fire service. So an important key figure for you to remember on how to mitigate any type of hazard in the fire service is the hierarchy of control. So on your screen, you'll notice an upside down triangle, which are strategies on how to mitigate any type of hazard within the fire service. We begin at the top with elimination and we work our way down to encouragement. So what are some strategies to using the hierarchy of control to impact sleep and fatigue in the fire service. So let's begin with administrative controls. One strategy is to limit shift work to the essential jobs. Try to organize the tasks that are being done that day on that 24 hour shift to limit the impact of physical and mental demands on your uh, workers. Try to schedule the toughest and the most dangerous tasks for early in the shift so that you can get them out of the way and have the easier tasks towards the tail end of the 24 hours and try to avoid schedule, scheduling demanding and dangerous tasks at the beginning of an early morning shift at 7 a.m. The other thing is to have administrative controls. So tailor your supervision. So extra supervision between the times of 3.30 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. Also, you wanna make sure that your younger workers who 
have more accidents at the start of their shift following the weekend. So make sure you have someone always supervising them, as well as our older, adult, uh, older workers who have more accidents at the end of a shift. So you want to supervise the inexperienced workers more closely until uh, they learn their job you know, even better. We want to encourage good eating habits at night, encourage light meals uh, that they're nutritious and easy to digest. You also want to allow adequate meal and rest breaks. And lastly, have good emergency plans in place for odd shifts. So a nighttime emergency, responders may be fewer than in the day. So let's talk about some engineering controls, going back to our hierarchy of control. So one of the things you can do is try to reduce night traffic, noise, and distractions, things that allow you to focus during your critical tasks. Be aware of the hazards around you, for yourself and for your team. Try to calculate any toxic exposures based upon shift duration. So if you're working a 12 or 24 hour shift, how do we loosen those hazards that are in your immediate area? Try to maintain prompt alertness. Keep an area bright and lit in order to keep your brain awake and alert to the activities at hand. Try to reduce any glare or refractive surfaces that may distract you and focusing on that immediate task. And lastly, if it's feasible, allow workers to play music or some activity that keeps them awake uh, through and physically engaged during the 24 hour shift. You also want to provide your workers with education and instruction. So treat shift, shift training like HASCOM. Also talk about health and safety difficulties. You want to emphasize the performance and accident risk and teach your employees to recognize social and family problems that all can stem from sleep disruption. So workers should know how to recognize health problems which may be related to shift work. Earlier, we talked about self-monitoring one's fatigue. Use this as an opportunity to understand how you and your body respond to sleep debt and tiredness, both physical and mental. You, workers should also know how to control shift work hazards and methods that can be used to do so. Use the hierarchy of control to break down what types of hazards may be impacting your sleep, sleepability, and your fatigue while at the fire station. Lastly, workers should know how to minimize the effect of shift work on themselves. Work on strategies that help to improve individual or organizational level factors for sleep and fatigue. And so you can do this by protecting their sleep period. So maintaining regular rest and wake routines, avoiding, avoiding exercising two hours before going to bed, also keeping light out of the bedroom or the bunks, and disconnecting the phone, maintaining a quiet, a quiet sleep area throughout the sleeping period. So let's recap. We talked earlier about the impact of food on sleep and fatigue. So try to eat, eat nutritious meals during your 24 hour shift. Be selective about what you eat and how much you eat in order to mitigate feeling sensations of tiredness. Keep a regular eating routine. Try not to go long periods or hours without eating to keep your metabolism running continuously. Select foods that are high in carbohydrates when you're ready to do a strong demanding physical task rather than trying to choose a meal that's heavy, fat, high protein before going to sleep. And so then again with your family and sleep time. So family and friends should be made aware of the potential harmful consequences of shift work. So they're able to adjust your family and social life to maximize interaction, but also to um, maximize your well-being. You wanna maintain your physical fitness and learn strategies to remain awake, remain awake at work. So we're gonna finish up with one last activity. So let's take five minutes as a group. And I want you guys to discuss what modifiable interventions can we do in our fire service to improve sleep initiation, sleep quality, and sleep duration. So welcome back. Now that you've had a few minutes to talk to your peers about what are some strategies at the individual level and at the worker level to mitigate sleep, remember to reflect and consider on the hierarchy of control. Each level of the hierarchy of control will help you break down possible solutions that you can do to mitigate sleep and fatigue in the fire service. If you wanna learn more and keep up to date about sleep and other cancer researcher research, please visit our website at sylvester.org forward slash firefighters. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to talk to you today about sleep in the fire service.